Hello. Today is the 21st of December, Thursday the 21st of December. I guess kind of what we call Christmas week or the week before Christmas or the week leading up to Christmas. Uh, tomorrow is my last day of work. <clears throat> I have uh, about two weeks off work and by God am I looking forward to it. This is probably like the first time in, in, uh, in years where I've been pining for, for, the, for the break to start. Um, <clears throat> and that's for many reasons. But anyway, uh, what we're going to look at today are four albums, all of which are secondhand, from the band Supergrass. Now, I've talked about some of these before in passing. But I haven't talked about all of them together, and I haven't talked about two of them at all. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, I think, yes, the first four Supergrass albums. First four, there aren't actually that many past that. Oh no, correction, this is the first three, skip one, and then the fifth. I don't have life on other planets. Um... And then they had Road to Ruin and Diamond Hoha. So <clears throat> their debut album, I Should Coco, this was released in 1995. And this came out when I was 14 years old. And I um, I remember when it came out and I remember the kind of uh, the buzz around this band as a teenager. And one of my friends, um, he kind of knew about them way before anyone else. And I remember... He got a T-shirt from given to him. He he was mates with like people. I don't know, like music store owners and guitar shop owners and you know, that kind of person. And somehow he managed to wrangle getting a, a promotional T-shirt of theirs, and it was a Caught by the Fuzz single T-shirt, and it was a picture, uh, the mugshot of Hugh Grant. Remember, Hugh Grant was arrested for. Um, picking up a prostitute in LA back in the 90s and there's that famous mug shot you might recognize if you were around in the 90s and they put Supergrass put that on a t-shirt and underneath it said caught by the fuzz you know the fuzz being the British slang for police and um, my friend was uh, quite proud of that t-shirt <clears throat> but yeah he kind of introduced me to the band and then um they kind of started being played on TV and radio and stuff like that <clears throat> off the back of this album. And I think it's a pretty great debut album. I should Coco. Quite a cool uh, cover. I got this second hand. I can't remember when or well, roughly in the last three years, but I can't remember exactly when or where. Um, from that glue residue, I'm going to guess I got it from Real Groovy Records. And it would probably have been around $4. I owned this new back in the 90s. I got it for Christmas in 1995, I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure it was 95. And it was definitely Christmas. Um, not much in the way of uh, notes. Thanks to everyone who helped us on the way. You know who you are. So there's quite a few singles off this album in the mid-90s. There was, I guess, <clears throat> I think Caught by the Fuzz was the first one, but um, there was Caught by the Fuzz, Man Size Rooster, All Right, which was probably the biggest song. Lenny was Strange Ones. No, I don't think it was. I think it was just those four. But um, like I said, I think All Right was the song that they're most known for. And um, it's the one where they're kind of, there's part they're like lying in a bed and the bed is kind of like it's like on the back of a truck or something and the camera's following them and some of them they're riding bikes and quite a um a memorable video but for me the, the best song was caught by the fuzz i always love that song it's kind of good like hard rock punk type sounding song um i also like the opener i'd like to know that's a cool song um I don't like the song Time. Sofa, I like that. Um, <clears throat> overall, it's just a, yeah, it's a good album. 
there's le- their little logo you see sometimes, the three members. And they are a three piece, at least to begin with. There's Mick Quinn, who's the bassist, Danny Goffey, I think it is, who is the uh, drummer, and Gaz Coombs, who is the singer and guitarist. Condition of this is fine. You can see there. Can you see there? It's reflecting everything off it. Um, it's fine, and the, the case is also in good condition, so that's good. <clears throat> but like I said, that would have been about $4 when I bought that. This one I've talked about before, so I'm not going to talk about this in detail. This was their second album, their follow-up, In It For The Money. It came out in 1997. This is my favorite album of theirs. This is one of my favorite albums overall of the entire 90s. I really love this album. Um, I got this also secondhand. This is a bit more expensive. It was $10, which is uh, more than I usually pay for a secondhand CD. But I, I told the story in the original video. If you're really interested, you can go back and watch that. But it's um, I was in a shop and I felt uh, kind of bad because... <laughs> You know, when you walk into a shop and you're the only person in there <clears throat> and the owner's right there and you kind of feel like you're going to buy something. Well, maybe that's just me. Um, so I did buy it, but I did want it. So as long as I didn't want it, I've owned this twice before. This is my third copy. The first two were new copies. This is a secondhand copy. Also in excellent condition. <laughs> Not really much any at all on that. And there's the band there evolving through the years this for me is like just a solid solid album from first song to last song isn't a bad song on it in my opinion maybe sun hits the sky i could take or leave but everything else excellent songs logo is still going still on parlophone then we get to i believe it was 1999 was it 1999 is there a date on here Yes, 1999, and they released their self-titled album, or sometimes called the X-Ray album. Now, I just got this recently, and I talked about it in passing one of my other videos where I was showing some things I found that day. This is a Red Dot special. Can't remember how much that was. For, again, $4, $2, $4, $4, something. It wouldn't have been more than $4, because generally at Real Groovy, I don't really pay much more than that on those special so-called special cds they're not really that special the prices nowadays on them um the good thing about buying things from real groovy is that the condition is almost basically near new so you're not paying 50 cents or a dollar but you are getting a basically a as close to new product as you'll find because when they buy things second hands they um they don't buy it if it's in shit condition, and if it is a little bit scratched up, they'll um, clean it up and replace the case, and they'll put it into one of those ultrasonic cleaners, the discs. I think this was a pretty good album. This kind of feels like they um, their popularity fell off a little bit with this album. Um, you can see by this stage they've taken in Robert Coombs, who's Gaz Coombs' brother on keyboards. He was on the previous albums, but he wasn't really considered to be a full member of the band, but I think he was by this stage. Um, so yeah, what I was saying is, yeah, they kind of, it felt like they kind of fell off a little bit in popularity with this album. Um, at the same time, it had some pretty big singles. It had that song Pumping on the Radio, um, which is track... Yeah, was it uh, nine? And I really don't like that song. It kind of reminds me a bit of a novelty song. And if you've seen the video as well, it kind of uh, reinforces that. Like can be like Muppets and puppets, and it's all a bit goofy. Um, but there are some ex- really excellent songs on this. <clears throat> such as the single Moving, which I think was the f- yeah the first song on the album. That's a great song. Um, I also li- like uh, What Went Wrong in Your Head. Really like Mary. Jesus Came From Outer Space. And I talked about this in the last album. I really love the last song, Mama and Papa. A very short song. It's probably less than two minutes long, that. 
And um, <clears throat> the unique thing, unique thing about that song is that Gaz Coombe doesn't sing the uh, vocals. It's sung by Mick Quinn, who wrote the song. And it's this very kind of beautiful, nostalgic, I wouldn't say like folk song, but kind of folkish. It reminds me of the 1970s for some reason. Not that I was even alive in the 1970s, but sometimes, you know, you get... Oops, my work phone just beeped. Um, sometimes you get feelings or nostalgia or kind of flashes of, of times of which you weren't alive for. And um, that is uh, how I feel about that song. It's just uh, a really beautiful song. And I think I said this on the previous video where I talked about this a little bit. I'd say... I really recommend going and listening to that song, Mama and Papa by Supergrass. He's actually, he's actually writing it from the perspective of a little kid. And maybe that adds to the nostalgic feeling. Kind of his old Englishness as well. Talk, he's talking about he misses his mum and dad. And that's <clears throat> another thing is weird. When I hear it, it kind of makes me miss my son if I'm not with him. <laughs> You know, when I remember when I was a, um, I've got a sister. I got, I got this, I got a lot of brothers and sisters. My younger sister, there's a ten year gap between her and me, and so when I, when she was born, I was ten, and I kind of felt, you know, I was like her big brother, but I felt, I don't know, very protective of her when I was a kid, in a strange way, and that I remember. When she was a baby, or like even when she was a toddler, I couldn't watch any, <laughs> that's going to sound mental, I couldn't watch any movies that had a baby in peril. Can you remember that movie Willow in the 1980s with Val Kilmer and um, I think Warwick Davis is in it, that uh, small guy. And there's a baby in that. I remember watching it and I, just, I had to turn it off. I had to go, leave the room because there was a baby in it. I thought something was going to happen to the baby. I don't know what's that got to do with the Supergrass. Anyway, um, like I said, I Don't Have Life on Other Planets, which was their fourth album. <clears throat> that kind of passed me by because I was a really big fan of theirs for these first two albums. If, if you had talked to me in the late 90s, especially 95, 96, 97, 98, and said um, 10 favorite bands, I'd say there'd be a pretty good chance that Supergrass were in that list. Then by the time we got to 99, I would still like them, but I would kind of just, you know, I would, my musical taste had gone in other directions. I still, I bought this Iron Man though, and back in 99, 2000. But then we got to Life on Other Planets, which was 2002. And it kind of passed me by. I remember seeing the single Grace, seeing the video for that, and not really thinking a whole lot of anything about it. And um, I can't even really say what else... I have even heard from that album. But then they came to Road to Ruin. And Ruin here is the R-O-U-E-N, which is a city in um, France. I believe, I believe it's in Brittany. You know, Breton, the uh, the north or the, the west. Because um, I think they had a studio there, or at least they recorded in a studio in Ruin. Ruin in Brittany. Hang on one second. Or we'll correct that. Not Brittany, uh, Normandy. They are next to each other, but Breton is that kind of more the peninsula part, I think, which was kind of they have their own language, or at least they did. Whereas Normandy, of course, from we know from D Day and all that stuff, is more uh, up towards facing the English Channel part. Regardless, they recorded an album there. Some geography of France. Still on Parlophone. So I wonder what, what their record deal was with them. Maybe five. I, Maybe maybe it was all of the albums they had on Parlophone. But anyway, uh, not much in the way of liner notes. Again, it's just a single leaf. Saw the same members. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, it's more of a... Um, they had a very upbeat kind of uh, chipper sound on their first album. A little bit more restrained on the second album and third album. This one, I feel... Um, is much more has a calmer and darker vibe overall and i'm pretty sure it, remember i remember when this came out seeing an interview with them on tv 
that the mo- one someone's mother died. I can't remember who it was. One of the members of the band's mother died, and that they felt the music wasn't kind of a reaction to that. So if you listen to what were the I can't remember what the singles were. I think St. Petersburg was a single. You listen to that song, St. Petersburg. Quite a sad, mournful sounding song. Even just if you listen to the the melody and the the overall vibe of the song. I think Low C was the other single. I'm not the keenest on that song, to be honest. Overall, I think this is an okay album, but <clears throat> I think it's a step down from their first three, certainly from their first two, because like I said, that second album in particular is for me is a classic album, and it's kind of always going to be a bit hard to compare to that. I was just looking at some of the kind of uh, the critical critical reception. It kind of got overall kind of a you know seventy three out of one hundred Metacritic, critic, which is kind of the the aggregate of all the scores. <clears throat> and it says, uh, "Supergrass have outlasted most of their contemporaries." I guess they had. They were kind of part of that Brit pop wave, although kind of more on the edges of it. Uh, and still have it in them to truly, to make a truly amazing master, masterpiece. Unfortunately, Road to Ruin is not quite it. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You wouldn't say they've, they've made a masterpiece. And I'm not sure if they really are um, capable of a masterpiece. Masterpiece is a, is a pretty big claim to make, isn't it? Anyway, uh, this was also secondhand. Again, the thing I got this from Real Groovy would have been about, again, $2. 2 to $4, I would have guessed. And the condition of this is excellent like all the other ones were as well anyway that is my supergrass collection four albums from british band who i used to really love a lot thanks